In this video, we discuss how to go global. And I'm joined by the founder and CEO of Global Point View Limited, Paul Rupert. Welcome to How to Business, I'm Frederick Weiss. And in this video, I am joined by Paul Rupert, founder and CEO of Global Point View Limited. Thank you for sharing your time and insight with me, Paul. Hey, Frederick, great to be here today. Thanks for the opportunity to talk to your listeners. I really appreciate you joining me today, Paul. You're such an intelligent guy. You've had such an exciting career from selling stereos in college to negotiating legislation on the U.S. Senate floor. Your journey took you to Silicon Valley. Could you share your story with us, Paul? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So I have uh, two decades of experience in the telecoms media and technology industry as both a senior executive and strategy consultant back to the industry and to enterprises looking to leverage mobile services, specifically text messaging in their operations or as part of their customer's experience. I've been characterized as an ambidextrous executive because I have prior experience, as you mentioned, in the federal government and in the political and policy world. And then I pivoted out of that into the private sector. And then moreover, I've also been in very small startups in two occasions, as well as large global enterprises and helped build both of those uh, beyond what they were when I walked into the door. So, Excellent. Well, you are the right person then to talk about this subject that we're going to discuss today, which is how to go global. I watched an episode of you on Talking with the Experts podcast hosted by Rose Davidson. And I, I was captivated by the discussion and the whole subject of going global from the start. So first off, what does it mean to go global? Yeah, so I'll give you the textbook explanation um, first off. So when you think about um, markets and markets that you want to be operating in, in most cases, uh, you might be thinking about your around the corner in the city, in the state, or nationally. And in most cases, in the context of telecommunications, the reality is that you need to be thinking global. So a domestic company is obviously selling into or within a nation state economy, if you will, and marketplace. And then an international one is essentially looking to essentially take that same product or service and maybe put a different shrink wrap around it and then sell it cross border. Um, you're still focusing on your own market as being the center of your economic driver, your performance engine, however you want to characterize it. But you also have this ancillary, uh, secondary or um, other supporting market that is cross border. And you can then have multiple cross borders, but you're still focusing on your primary domestic market first and foremost, and the other parts are just secondary. To go completely global is when it's irrespective of the borders, and you are looking at cross border operations that may be far, uh, far field from your own domestic operations, which may be the largest percentage of your business, or even more so if you get to the point where your business is driven by global opportunities and global markets, not just what where you're headquartered or where you may have started off the company. Now, the space that I operate in and have been involved in for 20 plus years, which is mobile telecommunication services, I started off as an international roaming director. That's the individual who's inside a mobile network operator, let's say like T-Mobile US or Verizon, that essentially negotiates the B2B contracts, meaning the contracts, the commercial aspects that both technologically enable you to, let's say, get on a plane from Washington, D.C. and land in London or land in China, and your phone within milliseconds is already operating and you are already within what's called a visitor location register. So this is a commercial structure and process in place between the mobile network operators themselves. 
And that's how I got into the global telecommunications business. So I happen to be half French. So I was able to leverage, let's say, my genetic predisposition to being internationally oriented. Uh, and I, I was able to leverage that exposure and understand how to be able to build out markets um, as a result of that. And then later, I got into a startup that became a very phenomenally successful um, startup in the context of text messaging, SMS interoperability, meaning being able to take a text message from the baseline GSM uh, format, what's called radio format, to non-GSM because text message was just part of the GSM functionality, but it wasn't in other parts, other radio format functionalities like CDMA, otherwise known as Verizon back then, 20 years ago. And we created the bridge, we created the means for text messaging to go between and among any operator of any radio format all around the world. So we knew, specifically when I walked in, um, I recognized that the business was not going to be going from zero to one, like most startups focus on, but could go from zero to a billion, and that we would have greater opportunities by connecting offshore mobile network operators with our customer base onshore, meaning Verizon, T-Mobile US and others, as opposed to when before I arrived, they were just focusing on the, the American market, which was taking a message from Verizon and being able to send it to T-Mobile, you know, non-GSM to a GSM. And because we changed the level of the horizon to truly global opportunity, we made it accretive, we made it bigger opportunity, and we were able to uh, outpace our competitors as a result of that. So that's kind of the textbook scenario and application from my own background in terms of how to think globally, as well as then going off and being able to execute against that. Excellent. So for those of us who uh, aren't half French or, or don't have a, <laughs> don't have any kind of a international perspective in, in that sense, what, what are some of the fundamental steps an organization could take to extend their business internationally? What are some things they should be thinking about? It's no different than what you how you attack and engage a campaign within uh, a domestic market, which is you look at your opportunity set, you know, what's the total addressable market and what's the serviceable addressable market, meaning what can you actually engage within the context of this marketplace? And then start segmenting and prioritizing where you want to expend your resources and where you think you've got an opportunity relative to the value proposition within that context. So uh, that, that process is no different than what you would do for a domestic market. You're just now approaching it a little differently because there are going to be cultural norms that are probably certainly going to be different than how you operate. There are going to be economic processes and pressures and factors that are going to be different relative to other parts of the world. There is going to be a matter of how do you break into those markets? You can do that on your own if you have the right type of solution. If you're selling cupcakes, it's going to be tough for you to be able to do that on your own. But sure. if you're selling a solution to a, a B2B solution to like mobile network operators or enterprises um, that has a global impact or a, a global marketplace, then you choose, all right, do, I, do we want to do this on our own? You know, it's like the build, buy, rent or partner solution. Can you build it yourself? Can you go off and buy it, meaning acquire a market? You know, and that's oftentimes the motivation behind inorganic or mergers and acquisitions where you think about, mm. which is exactly what we did uh, about three years into um, the effort that I was talking about, which was a five year, uh, my engagement with the company was for five years by the time we sold it. Um, about year three, we recognized that there were other companies that we could acquire that were smaller and that would allow us to expand our footprint um, uh, geometrically as opposed to arithmetically. So we looked at a company that was based in France, but had operations in Singapore and mobile network operator clients all around the world. And we knew that that would be a perfect fit for us. So you look at, again, what's the terrain? 
what's the objective? Start with the answer is often when I have a conversation with either as a consultant or, you know, in my own context of where do we want to be at the end of the day, benchmark where you are today, look at the gap, meaning between the two, and then start making plans. How do we get to that? And then the vehicles, either acquire, build, buy, rent. Rent is what I mean by that, or let's say partnership. You start looking for other players in the space or suppliers that you might be able to partner with hmm. on a technology basis or a commercial basis. And as a result, or let's say strategic basis in the context you see a fit for whatever reason, and they become the means in which you're able to uh, attack the territory or engage in a campaign to expand your business globally. Yeah. So for outside of uh, technology, one of the things you brought up as a cupcake company, looking at strategic acquisitions of yeah. maybe a chocolate factory in France, et cetera, et cetera, that could be a little bit more challenging. Or you could also think about a disruptive model. I think one of the things I've heard you talk about was the, the candlestick maker and somebody making surfboard wax, you know, maybe there's alternative opportunities. Do you mind expanding into sure, like how, a, how, how we could think about the a disruptive model? Yeah. For those of you who like to read, uh, there's a great book called by Clayton Christensen called The uh, Innovator's Dilemma, where he breaks down that model that you were talking about. The candlestick maker is fo focusing on making candles, and yet he's got a resource that he doesn't know can be equally applied or even even um, have a, a bigger impact if applied in an adjacent arena. So the adjacent players, meaning the the surfboard makers who recognize that there's various types of waxes that help. I remember <laughs> one of them was like, when this first started coming out, there was a product called Sex Wax. You know, yeah. and it was like the, the greatest combination of what most of us are thinking about every day with adventuresome sports as well as something, you know, very easily applied, which is, you know, the purpose of wax is so you stay on the board as a surfer. So the adjacent disruptors come into the, uh, you know, in this case, it's the guys who are providing, creating the surf wax and looking at a candlestick maker and realizing, okay, they have a, a resource, a supply that we can take advantage of and repurpose it. And so in the same way, you start thinking about how do we look at this as a disruption of what those who are just focusing on their performance engine, meaning you know, doing what everybody does on a day-to-day -day basis, as opposed to widening your vision, we all tend to narrow down. And because we get so narrowed down in terms of how fast the engine is running, tweaking the engine to make it more, more efficient. But meanwhile, the market is changing so radically that we see, we miss the opportunity that is really right in front of us. So. That's a little bit of a background in terms of the theory, but Innovator's Dilemma by Clayton Christensen, he gets into all these things. Yeah, and and we'll there's another one called, the yeah, the Innovator's DNA, which is kind of like a handbook of, you may not think this way, but here's how you can think this way. Hmm. And he goes through all these different steps. I mean, I, I had a product team working for me in a, a prior role, and I gave the book to everybody on the team. I love that. Another thing that I've heard you discuss on Rosa's show was being able to go global from the start. You could be creative immediately. Can you dive into exactly what you mean by being creative immediately? From from my understanding, it's it seems like you could have faster growth, tons more opportunities, but I'd like to hear that from you. Well, you, you got it. Not only creative, but also creative. So creative is in terms of the expanding your perspective and your horizon mm -hmm. in terms of how you're going to be able to apply these various solutions um, in various parts of the world. I mean, creative, here's an example. Um, I, when I first started looking and breaking down the market in this messaging business, um, I took and pegged it against voice minutes. And what I mean by that is back then, most of us used telephony for voice calls. And there are all kinds of research as to how much voice minutes are distributed across every nation around the world. And in the United States, the, the principal connection is between the United States and the United Kingdom in terms of global telephony. And so I'm looking through this and I'm realizing that the Philippines was like in the top six, I think. Hmm. And the time frame we're talking about is 2000. And I'm asking myself, why would there be such a high percentage 
of the distribution of total U.S. voice minutes to the Philippines. Well, at the time, you know, the Philippines were still a major, we had uh, a port there as well as a, an Air Force base there. So that had something to do with it. The Philippines is a very large economy in the context of Asia, not as big as China, but clearly a strong level two player in terms of the um, global marketplace. And then I started doing some research, demographic research in the U.S. on languages spoken in the U.S. And I came up with a figure that showed that Tagalog, which is the Filipino language, is like the fourth most often spoken second language in U.S. homes. So, you know, they may speak uh, immigrants, they may speak um, English outside of the home, but inside the home, in this case, the Philippines was very, very high. So by measuring those two, I realized, okay, this is going to be a great market. And then started talking to the Filipino operators and realizing from their perspective, they could tell me, yeah, well, you know, our, our I think at the time, the two most frequent calls by area codes were into Las Vegas and Houston, Texas. Why Las Vegas? Well, again, because the economy of the Philippines is so driven by uh, foreign workers and the sending back of remittances, and a lot of Filipinos end up going to Las Vegas to work for either as nurses or inside the casinos or you know whatever the business might be. Houston really never got through to me as to why that was the case. But by being creative, I then walked into Verizon with the domestic sales lead who's, who was responsible for Ver the Verizon customer base. And we were kind of like, hey, we see an opportunity that we can provide you with greater messaging on a global basis, which then drives, by the way, the amount of voice calls. So by using text messaging, that became a gateway to greater long distance revenues and long distance revenues are highly mar are very, very, very high margins. You know, it's international, so you can charge more for it. And that was the creative element as to how do we look at this a little differently instead of just linearly A to B to C, we had to look at the whole picture and then start making those connections and having a sense of an integrative approach or combinatorial approach by a guy, a guy named Daniel Pink is the one guy who came up with this, this notion, which is, you know, you're trying to orchestrate the entire market together and and uh, refine it so that you have a greater impact for yourself. Now, the other piece is the accretive piece, which is finance. So the accretive is essentially how is this going to be um, going to a higher level of revenues instead of, as I say, arithmetically, and instead, can we do this geometrically? Well, when you start talking about um, global networks, the value of the network is not the network in and of itself. It's not an additive in terms of every node. So let's say um, if, if you were to add Burkina Faso and let's say Switzerland in terms of your overall network, you're not adding two new nations. There's actually an equation called Metcalfe's law that shows that it's actually a geometric expansion of the network because each node that is enabled or energized creates an entire new network in and of itself. So each node becomes a constellation of connections. So if you're able to get more and more nodes into your own network, you're able to escalate and make that the value of your network accretive especially in the context of competing against those who are just focusing on the North American market. As I mentioned earlier, you know, I was brought in and made the pitch that the board bought into and the founders bought into that, yeah, this is going to be a differentiator for us as we go to the market, which is exactly what transpired. And within five years, we sold the company for just about a half a billion dollars from scratch. A lot of that is about taking risk. I've heard you say investors want a 12 X return on a five-year plan. And it seems you could achieve that if you have a bigger pond to fish in. So more Absolutely. of these nodes yeah. help you provide those opportunities. S speaking of which, how can people discover more of these opportunities? Maybe these things aren't so apparent to everyone. What's the best resources or some things you could recommend? 
Well, uh, you know, I wish I, I could tell you, well, I wrote a book called Glowing, Going Global from the Start, but <laughs> um, <laughs> maybe that's I, on the horizon. Maybe, you know, it takes a long time to write a book. Um, but uh, let's see, the founder of LinkedIn created a book. Um, I've forgotten its name, but um, which is Blitzscaling. And Ooh. he wrote the book like 10 years after I had done everything that I was telling, talking to you about, but I've read it since then. And a lot of the things that I saw are the same things that he's been able to articulate. Now he happens to have a PhD in computer science, so he's able to articulate much better than I can. Um, but that's probably one of the first things you can look at to give you a sense of how to be able to go from zero to a billion instead of zero to one, which is usually the case in most startups. Um, but it's also a matter of just look beyond your borders and start looking for opportunities, especially now, you know, in the context of not only because of the emergence of globalism and that may retrench because of all the conditions that are going on right now. I mean, you know, we've got a major war um, and a number of secondary wars and um, globalization has kind of been retrenched, especially post Trump. Um, but the reality is that we're able to make these connections much easier through telecommunications platforms like this one, um, which happens to be another arena that I'm involved in called communications platforms as a service, which integrates voice, text, video, um, over the top messaging, email, even artificial intelligence and chatbots. So if you're in the right space, you got to think expansively. Um, and don't limit yourself. You know, you mentioned earlier, um, one of the things that I've mentioned a couple of times in some of the podcasts I've been interviewed on is the, um, the RAF's Special Air Squadron, the SAS. And their motto is, who dares wins, you know. And mm. there's another one, which is, uh, fortune favors the audacious. So don't limit your thinking because you think, well, we can't do that expand your thinking in terms of how can we do this? As I said, start with the answer in terms of what you want, benchmark what you have today in terms of time, money, people, talent, will, or even technology, and then look at the gap and figure out what do we need to do? What resources can we apply that I just kind of listed through very quickly so that you have a sense of here's how we bridge this, here's what the journey is going to have, what the journey is going to take, how do we uh, minimize the uh, execution risk? Well, you do that by good planning and then putting the plan in place, execute against it, following against it, you know, uh, holding it to key performance indicators. And over time, you'll be able to get to that level. Um, and in my case, again, from my own experience, as we looked at the global market, um, our process was I knew that I had 1,400 mobile network operators around the world that I could go after. Uh, in some cases, I knew some of those people because of my prior experience. And so I then segmented it down as to back to who has the highest number of voice minutes, which came down to about 125 different operators around the world. Mm -hmm. And then I ranked those in the context of tier one, tier two, tier three operators. And also because of my experience, the prior experience with the mobile network operator world, I recognize that some were going to be more risky than others because they were highly, they were operating in highly competitive marketplaces like in Hong Kong or um, in the UK and other places that I knew that they there would be an operator that was willing to take that risk, you know, try this new type of solution. And in most cases, you know, it's kind of sold itself. But that's the process that I went through. And even starting from scratch, there were only two of us, myself and a guy who spoke Spanish, who had lived in Venezuela, who's an American. And I said, OK, I want you to do Southern Europe and Latin America. And I did all the other parts of the world, primarily Asia and Europe, which were kind of where we were getting our beachheads. And from those 125, we broke it down to about 25. And then I engage what I called parallel priorities, meaning you can't go everything at the same time, but you can decide these are the top 25. And once we started getting traction, my first customer was in the UK. My second customer was in the Philippines. So we then reallocated our focus from the ones that weren't really producing to the ones that were producing. 
and it was a land and expand strategy, meaning we got one one operator in the UK, we knew we'd get the others. We got one operator in the Philippines, we knew we'd get the other, which is exactly what we, what transpired, you know, within like six months. Wow. That makes me think about going global. Uh, I want to hear more about Global Point View Limited. You mind telling us about the company? Sure. That's essentially my consulting company that, uh, as I mentioned, I've both been executive as well as consultant. And my clients have included MasterCard, Facebook, Western Union, Live Person, uh, as well as uh, the aggregators themselves, meaning the industry that I've been involved in that used to be my competitors. And, uh, you know, once I started doing consulting work, it became word of mouth in the context of how I might be able to provide assistance. Um, in some cases, I do like commercial due diligence uh, projects for the likes of I'm working on one working on one right now for the National Bank of Kuwait private equity arm, looking at a, uh, a one of the aggregators that at one point was a competitor of mine uh, relative to what they want to do in terms of their own expansion. And they're looking for financial support for that same expansion. I've also done work with the major trade associations in the mobile space, the GSM association, the mobile ecosystem forum, the mobile marketing association. So what I do is essentially, um, provide a strategic perspective and an execution capability relative to go to market or direction mergers and acquisitions, post-merger integration, a whole host of projects and uh, initiatives that focus within the mobile services world. I love it. And I'm sure people are going to want to find out more information on you and your company. Where should they go, Paul? The best thing is LinkedIn. So I'm on LinkedIn as Paul R. Rupert, or you can just send me an email directly at P. Rupert, R-U-P-P-E-R-T at G-P-V-L-T-D dot com, which is my corporate email. Thank you, Paul. And we'll have all those links in the show notes. Paul, we're at the end here. I'd like to provide you with an opportunity for some closing words of wisdom. Closing words of wisdom. Well, I mean, given the given the discussion that we've held so far, um, I, I think the ones that I mentioned earlier in terms of who dares wins and uh, fortune favors the audacious, that's been kind of my watchwords and the ideas that I look at uh, going forward, looking at new markets, looking at new opportunities. Don't hold back. Swing for the fences. I love that. Paul, thank you so, so much for being on the show. My pleasure, truly my honor. Thank you so much. And thanks for sharing your insight with me and the audience. Thank you, Frederick. It was a great time. I very much enjoyed it. I hope everybody enjoyed it in terms of your listeners and, and audience. Thank you so much. Cheers. Cheers.